What a great day to be in worship. It looks like the, the weather kind of held off for us not to be so wet this morning. So a great day to be in worship. My name is Pastor Andrea. I want to say a welcome to you that have gathered online and also in person. If it's your first time with us, a special welcome to you. And we want to know that everyone's here. So if you would fill out the, the registration pad that's in your pew and pass it to your neighbor. And if you're online, there's a connect card for you to fill out as well. So if you're first time with us, fill it out so we can get a welcome gift to you on this week. As we are gearing up with just a couple weeks before school starts, it's a great opportunity for us to um, celebrate and um, prepare our teachers um, that are in our, our community partners right across the street from us, our church. And so there is, in our newsletter, there is a list of um, items that you could um, pick up and drop them off um, before worship in the back-to-school baskets that you see as you walked in, but also if you come through the front doors of the church on the other side, the office side, there is a basket for you to drop those items off during the week as well. So Monday to Friday, 9 to 2 p.m., if you want to pick up some items for teachers and kick that school off um, really good for those um, um, who are going to be teaching our future leaders of the world. <laughs> I want to invite you to stand up as we are um, come to our call to worship. Shout to the rooftops. Our Lord Jesus Christ is seated at God's right hand. The same Christ who was given by God to help us learn how to live together and love each other is now seated with God. Don't stand staring into the heavens. Christ's spirit is with us, in us, and through us. Rejoice and dance happily. It is not time to mourn. Come, join in praising God with our whole lives and spirit and all the people shouted, let us worship God. Let us pray together. Come, Holy Spirit, pour out your love on all those gathered here and inspire us to see God's vision for us in this place at this time in our city, state, and world. May we know the call you have upon all of our lives. Amen.
Good morning. This month you have been getting to know me. I've been sharing some of my stories with you all and helping you understand uh, who I am. But today we're going to look at who we are together. So we're going to talk a little bit about my leadership style and then how that works within this community of faith as well. So uh, we're going to frame that up by hearing a passage from Acts chapter 1. So hear now the word of the Lord. As a result, those who had gathered together asked Jesus, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? Jesus replied, It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After Jesus said these things, as they were watching, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going away, and as they were staring toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood next to them. They said, Galileans, why are you standing here looking toward heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way that you saw him go into heaven. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts, our minds, and our eyes that we might see and know the word you have for us this day. In your holy name we pray. Amen. So which first day of school do you remember the best? Was it that day that your parents dropped you off for kindergarten to make your own new way in the world, to meet new friends? Or maybe you moved in the middle of a school year, and so your first day was a different first day than most people's, and so it stands out because of that unique moment. For me, the first day that I tend to remember the most clearly was that first day of college. And it wasn't the first day in classes. It was the day that my dad took me up to the University of Arkansas and dropped me off and left me there in that dorm room that I was supposed to assemble. And I remember thinking how exciting this was because this was the first school I had really chosen. And I, and I had researched and visited and made all of these plans, and this was the place I chose to be. And so I was excited about that, and I was excited about the future that was before me as a result of that choice. But if I'm honest, I was also nervous. Because I knew a few people on the U of A campus, but I didn't know many. This was going to be a whole new group of people. But this also was going to be a place where I knew I was going to be transformed. And while transformation is exciting, it's also intimidating. It also means that you're going to be a new person, you're going to be shaped into a new being, and, and there's some nervousness with that as well. And there was the nervousness of this was a temporary place. The very nature of college is that you don't stay in that place but you, you're transformed, you're nurtured, you're educated, and then you're sent out to live in the real world. Now, I don't know why I was so nervous about that reality, because that pattern shows up in our lives often. It is not unusual for us to come to a place to experience transformation, and then to go out from that place, new people, with new vision and new goals. In fact, that is the very pattern that Jesus is describing to the disciples in this passage. He is telling them, he is foreshadowing what is going to happen is that you will be gathered together, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit, and then you will be sent out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And that is exactly what happens at Pentecost. The disciples are gathered in the upper room, huddled together, and then the Holy Spirit comes in as a wind and equips them in new ways, gives them the power to speak in new languages, to carry the gospel to the ends of the earth, which they then do. This is a regular pattern that we encounter. And it's a pattern that this church has described in its vision. I love the vision that this church pulled together a few years ago, and I'm going to read just a little bit of it, that you see yourselves as a mission station to equip disciples for building relationships with people who are far from home and feel far from God. 
you see how that has that same pattern in it? You come together in this mission station. You're equipped or transformed. And then you are sent to carry out that word to the people who are far from home and feel far from God. I love this mission, this vision statement. I love it. I'm so excited to be living into it. But I love it not just because it describes this sort of pattern, but because it reflects Lucan discipleship. So what do I mean when I say Lucan discipleship? Well, I'm going to need you to recall a sermon series that happened at the beginning of this year. You, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. You didn't know there was going to be a quiz, right? <laughs> But at the beginning of this year, you all did a study called Gospel Discipleship in which you learned that there are four ways of understanding discipleship based on each of the four Gospels. And each of those four understandings resonates with people differently. So, so some of you might resonate more with Matthean discipleship, some with Markin, some with Lucan, some with Johannine discipleship. And the wonderful thing about understanding that is, is as you understand your own discipleship better, you can live more fully into that journey. But also, as you understand that other people may understand discipleship a little bit differently, you're able to work more fully alongside them. You're able to work better together. Now, we each as individuals have an understanding of discipleship that frames us. But also when we get together as a whole, we tend to have a dominant understanding of discipleship that we reflect. Now, we did not get enough tests um, in January to know overall what this congregation's leaning is as far as its discipleship. But I'm just going to go ahead and assume that you're Methodist. <laughs> Jumping out there on a limb, right? As I have worked with, with folks with gospel discipleship, if you didn't know, I'm the author of the books. So you started working on gospel discipleship, then you got the author, so now you're stuck with it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, but as, as, um, as I worked with different churches all across the United States on this, there are a few Methodist churches that are not Lucan, but for the most part, if you're a Methodist church, your overall leaning is to Lucan discipleship. And that's because Lucan discipleship grows in relationships with one another. So that's really where Methodists grow in their discipleship is by walking alongside one another, showing love to each other, living life together. And that's true to who we are. I mean, we have this understanding of grace that God seeks a relationship with all of us. We have this long history of gathering together in small groups and asking, how is it with your soul? That's relational work, right? We're even a connectional church. We stay in relationship with other Methodist churches around us. So it's true to who we are. So that vision statement that you all have articulated is a beautiful articulation of that Methodist understanding of discipleship. So it's powerful in that sense, but it is also powerful in its appropriateness to your mission field. If we think about the two, two groups of people that we're seeking to be in relationship with, let's talk about first those who feel far from God. That is just our culture now. We are dealing with a far more secular culture, and we're dealing with a culture in which a, a vast number of people have either been hurt by the church or have never grown up in the church. And so they don't even have an awareness of what the value of church or a community of faith would be. And so that's one group of people that, that is around us, no matter where we are in this culture. But then... For those that, who are far from home, this part of the world is made up of a lot of people, some of you, in fact, who have relocated here to start a new life and to create a new home. So that vision spells out reaching out and being in relationship to two very important groups in our area. Now, when we talk about vision statements, it's, it's one thing to have a vision, right? Right? It's another thing altogether to make it happen. We can talk about it all day, but if we don't have a plan for it to happen, then it's just air. So how are we going to make it happen? Well, first, let's just step back and recognize that this is a regular pattern that we are accustomed to doing. Coming together, bringing your giftedness, your passions, your energy into a place, where other people bring their giftedness, passions, and energy into a place, we collectively are transformed by that interaction, by the equipping that takes place there, and then we go out. 
That's, that's a pattern we are accustomed to. But that's still talking in very general terms. Let's talk specifics about how we're going to do that here. And I think we need to talk about it first in, in consideration of who your pastoral leadership is. Because this vision was created before Andrea or I got here. So how's this going to work now with two new leaders? Well, let's talk about that. And let's talk about it in terms of our understanding of discipleship. So we are blessed and gifted to have an associate pastor here in Andrea who actually is what I call in gospel discipleship a four-typer. She tests evenly across the board, Lucan, Matthean, Markin, and Johannine, which means she can walk in all kinds of discipleship spaces, in all kinds of ways, with all kinds of people. And I am so grateful to have her as a partner in ministry, uh, bringing that to the table. On the other hand, I test very strongly Mark and Johannine. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about what that means as far as for a leader. So Markins are, pa are people who are driven by the Holy Spirit. We get this energy from the Holy Spirit and we, we, we move as the Spirit moves us. Johannines grow through mentor-apprentice relationships. Um, and so Johannines love to, to be taught or to teach. So what that means for you to have me as your leader is that as someone who's driven by the Holy Spirit, I come from this perspective. Every single one of you who have come in this doors, and that's whether you've come in the doors physically or if you've come in online with us, every single one of you who has joined us has brought a gift of the Holy Spirit in these doors. Every one of you is gifted by the Holy Spirit and gifted for a unique and powerful purpose. And the very fact that you have joined us means that something of the Spirit said you are to live that gift out here in this community. And so I am assuming that you have brought a passion, a gift, something important that's meaningful for our community. And we're going to start from there. And then as a Johannine, I'm going to make sure you're equipped to then live that gift out. We'll figure out what you need for that passion to come to be. Now, how is that going to work? Well, it's going to start on a very individual level. Andrea and I need to have a conversation with every single one of you. I do not care how old or how young you are. You matter in this space. And I need to know what is driving you. Andrea needs to know what is driving you. And so we're going to have a conversation with you. We have a pattern for these conversations so we can get a sense of, of everyone's giftedness. But it basically, there are four questions that we're going to center this conversation around. Now, some of you have already been um, ambushed by me. You came in to visit with me about something else, and I said, so while I've got you here, we're going to have a conversation. So thank you to the folks that, that have been good sports and didn't know what they were getting asked before they got asked. You all now have a heads up, okay? So here are the four questions that we're going to center around in that conversation. Number one, when did you most feel like a disciple of Jesus Christ? Or, if you are new to the faith, when did you feel like your life had the most purpose? Then I'm going to ask you, what breaks your heart? Then we're going to ask, what makes your heart sing? Or what gives you joy? And then the last question, and this is the one that stumps people, because I want you to think big. The last question is, if there were no limitations, if you had access to as much money, as much resources, as much um, power and, and people and resources, if you had access to everything, what would you do? It's amazing how much is revealed in those four questions, how much it tells me about who you are and what the Spirit has planted in you. So once we have, have had those conversations, and I will tell you that I've already seen some amazing things from those conversations. From those conversations, I've already identified two people who would make wonderful confirmation mentors. I've identified two people who could serve on the finance committee. I have identified four people who could do online engagement for us. Just from those four questions, we have found those folks. And I'm seeing a thread of a common passion. 
People have asked me as I've come here, what is your vision for this church? And my vision is to see your vision. Because I don't have the vision, we have the vision. God has given that to all of us. So this is how I find it. This is how I hear it. This is when you bring your stories, then I go, aha, and I'm already seeing a common thread. I'm not going to tell you what it is because I want to make sure that's the thread that we need to head to. But as soon as, we, as soon as we know what that is, as soon as we've discerned it, boy, we will lean into it. And I will tell you, there will be nothing that will stop us. Nothing. Because it will be the thing that the Holy Spirit intends us to do. And so then we will do corporate equipping. And I will start saying, oh, you know what? This person here has this passion and this person here has the same passion. These two need to get together and let's see what happens. And sometimes that may mean you will meet with somebody in the first service. Because you have similar passions and you didn't know it. And that's what we're going to find. And then as we see a whole vision for this church, we'll start equipping you from the pulpit with it. We'll make sure that you have the resources that you need. We'll start directing the budget. We'll start having, adding classes. We'll start making sure that you can be the people that, that God has called you to be. I firmly believe that whatever the Holy Spirit intends for us to do, we have everything we need to get it done. We just need to know we have everything we need to get it done. So we will lean into that big vision that God has for us. And we will speak the Pentecost language that we have been given. You know, when Peter, on the other side of that Pentecost moment, preaches, he says, he quotes Joel and says, your, your elders will dream dreams, your young will have visions. Y'all, it's happening. You have dreams and visions. You just don't know the dream and vision of the person on the other side of the room. As soon as you do, we will move. And we have to remember that, that as we have this vision and as it's revealed, it's not for us. It's not to keep us here because that's not the movement that we have. We come here collectively to assemble, to be equipped, and then to go out from here. And especially for those populations that we've named in our vision, it is critical that we leave the building. It's critical for those who are far from home because we are strangers. And it's so much more welcoming if we can go to them and welcome them there. But then, for those who feel far from God, this place is a threat. This is a place of injury. And so we need to go to them and love them there and hear them there and bring God's vision there. What is the last day of school? that you remember. I don't know that I remember any of those last moments in the classroom, but I remember graduations, don't you? And graduations come with that same bit of nervousness of not knowing what is ahead, but they also come with a feeling that the world has been laid at our feet. You know, that's what Jesus did for the disciples, laid the world at their feet. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. Jesus is laying the world at our feet right now. So every Sunday ought to feel like a graduation. Every Sunday ought to feel like the world is at our feet. So move the tassel from one side to the other and be God's witnesses to the ends of the earth. Amen. Try it again. <laughs> On your bulletin, there is a um, perforated um, tear off there. If you would take a moment to see um, where you would like to serve, and um, and as the ushers come by, place those into the offering um, bag there. It's an opportunity for you to go ahead and get plugged in before we have those great conversations about where God is calling you to get plugged in. Um, we have opportunities for you to serve right now. And if you don't know what the, um, how to serve in the capacity that's here that you may be interested in doing, 
we will prepare you. So you're not going to be out on your own. We're going to um, get you trained and prepared to lead on Sunday morning. Let us pray. Gracious God, you have lavished upon us the riches of your glory. As Jesus fed the masses, providing enough for all, but more than enough left over. So you have fed us and provided for us. You shelter us, care for us, and bring us safely to each stop of our journey. As you're given to us out of your abundance, we return our offering to you with praise and thanksgiving. In the name of the Savior, we pray. Amen. Let us pray. God of tears, you are the giver of joy. Hear us as we pray for the sick. We pray for those with chronic illnesses, for those who have life-threatening conditions, for our members who are in the hospital or entering into rehab, for those sick with COVID, and for those with inadequate medical care. Bring the healing we need. We pray, O oh Lord, that you hear all those who are hungry. We pray for those who live in regions of drought and famine, for those who cannot afford nutritious food, for the vulnerable who are not adequately fed. We pray for those without means to to get through this coming week, O oh Lord. Give us the food we need. Hear us as we pray for those who grieve. We pray for those who mourn a loved one, for those whose communities are no more, and for those who cannot imagine a joyful future. Give us comfort to restore hope. God of the poor, and the poor in spirit. We pray for your help against all that oppresses as we look forward to the kingdom you have promised. 
and are bringing even now through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please stand and affirm our faith, found in our United Methodist hymnal on page 883. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God, who has created and is created, who has come in Jesus, the Word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We're called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope, and life and death and life beyond death. God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Amen.